let's talk about Aristotle's model of distributive justice. Remember that distributive justice is the question of how we should distribute the goods and responsibilities of a society to its members. The society here can be society at large. It could even be the international group of nations, but it could also be people within the company, people within a family, people within a class. And so there are questions that arise about who should get what good, what reward, what benefit, but also who should get what position of responsibility, who should bear what burden. And those are different kinds of questions. We might think there are different kinds of criteria. Some people deserve certain rewards, and with those rewards go certain responsibilities. Other kind of people, you might say, bear certain burdens, and it's not really because <laughs> there is some deserving, some benefit that goes along with it. Maybe it's just that they're best suited to bear the burden. And so we're going to think about a variety of questions like that. Aristotle confronts this, really the first person, I think, in the Western tradition to give us anything like a comprehensive analysis of the idea of distributive justice and to propose a model of it. Now, the model Aristotle proposes is highly intuitive, and so it's one that I think underlies many of our intuitive conceptions of justice, perhaps not all, but for a certain kind of problem. I think most of us still have an Aristotelian model of justice in mind. What is Aristotle's theory of distributive justice? He thinks that justice in this sense, like any virtue, is a mean between extremes. One can have too much or one can have too little. And so distributive justice is where each has just the right amount. And there are different ways then in which it can go wrong. One person may have more, one person may have less than what they deserve. Well, what do you deserve? Aristotle says we have to think about this in terms of proportions. That is to say, let's think about comparing two people's shares. I can't say what you deserve in absolute terms, because after all, it depends on how much there is to divide among the various members of the group. But we can talk about your share of the group's total and your share relative to somebody else. So rather than tackle the larger question of the entire group, let's just think about two people and think about their relative shares. Here's the idea. It's a question of equality. So if we're trying to understand the proper ratio between two people's shares, let's say A and B, and we're thinking about how to compare A's share and B's share, Aristotle says it comes down to this. And he thinks, by the way, this is a platitude, that everybody agrees with this. Everybody really has this in mind. It's a question of merit. What do they deserve? Well, it's a question of <laughs> their dessert. That is to say, what they merit. And so we can say it's a matter of A's merit as opposed to B's merit. So the proportion of A's share to B's share should be just the proportion of A's merit to B's merit. And if we think about this in terms that are, you know, easy to convert mathematically, essentially just swapping these, we can say that's the same as thinking that A's share relative to A's merit should be equal to B's share relative to B's merit. Now, if we think of merit as what you deserve, it does seem like this is a platitude. A's Share, compared to B's, should be a matter of, well, what A deserves compared to B. But the crucial term here, obviously, is merit. What does it mean to deserve something? What is merit? Aristotle says, look, everybody agrees that things should be distributed according to merit, but not everybody measures merit in the same way. People have different approaches to it, and in fact, it's appropriate. He discusses this more in the politics. He thinks that different political systems assign merit in politically important senses in different ways. But the key point that he talks about there is this. We think about the relevant sort of merit for the kind of good we're distributing. So indeed, if we're thinking about distributing political goods, like political offices, we want to think in terms of political merit or political virtue, as he puts it, your ability to make positive contributions to the community. But what about other things? Well, suppose we're thinking about distributing flutes to a group of flute players. Who should get the best flutes? The best flute players. Suppose we're thinking about an Olympic event. Who should get various medals? Well, the best person should get the gold medal. 
the next best, the silver medal, the next best, the bronze medal. When we think about things like this, we usually think there is some associated sense of merit that determines the justice of the distribution of the good. Now, sometimes it is obvious who should get the gold medal in the 100-meter dash? Well, the person who runs the fastest. Who should get the highest grade in the class? The student who performs the best. Who should get the Academy Award? The person in the relevant category who does the best job. But sometimes it's not so obvious. For example, we're thinking about salaries within a company. Who should get the highest salaries? Well, it's not obvious exactly what the criterion of merit is. Maybe it's importance to the company, but actually if we stop and think about that, and we'll do that later in much more detail, we'll see there are many different factors. So sometimes there is really one dimension of merit that's relevant here. Sometimes it's a complicated mix of dimensions. And many of the kinds of rewards we're most concerned about in society are in fact things that are multidimensional in this way. So it's easy for disagreements to occur about who has what degree of merit simply because people may be combining the different dimensions in different ways. Something similar happens even for awards where you might think there is an obvious dimension. Who should win the National Book Award for a given year? Well, the person who wrote the best book that year. But how do we tell what the best book was? There are different criteria. You might say books can excel in a variety of ways. There are various virtues that are relevant to assessing the worth of a book. And the same thing can happen in all sorts of other different areas. Who in baseball deserves the most valuable player award? Well, the player who was the most valuable. But how do you determine that exactly? How do you compare an excellent pitcher to an excellent hitter? It's a difficult thing. What about somebody who hits a lot of singles, but not much power, as opposed to somebody with a lower batting average, but lots of power? Very difficult to make those comparisons, even within batting. And the same thing can emerge in pitching. Somebody can have a better ERA, somebody else can be better in other dimensions. So there are many, many different dimensions that are relevant to some of these. But in some cases, it's really quite straightforward. We know exactly what the measure is. And Aristotle's point is simply that my share should be proportionate to my merit. Compared to other people's shares, it should be proportionate to merit, however we define that. Sometimes it'll be easy, sometimes it'll be hard. Aristotle's analysis holds for responsibilities and for burdens as well as for benefits. So it's not just the goods that we have to distribute after all, it's the responsibilities. It's the problems as well as the, the good things in life that get distributed among members of a group. And so, who should face those responsibilities? Who should bear those burdens? Well, here's one kind of question that we could ask. Let's say a group of us are traveling together to a conference. Who should drive the car? Well, the best driver, Aristotle would say. The one with the most merit that is relevant to the task. The task here is driving. And so we can ask, who is the best driver? Who's going to best accomplish the task of getting us there? Who should fly the plane? The best pilot. Who should fight in the army? Well, we could say, especially if we're facing a draft where it's not a volunteer type question, we could say, well, the people best able to fight. Which is why often the burden falls on younger people who are physically more capable of fulfilling the tasks required for actual fighting than older people. But there are other questions. Who should bear the tax burden that we have to impose in a society? Well, Aristotle would say those with the greatest, as it were, economic virtue, that is to say those best able to pay the taxes, best able to bear the burden. A question that especially interests him is the question of who should get political power, who should have the responsibility of leadership in the society. And his answer is those with the most political virtue. What does that mean? Well, those who are the best leaders, those who will best be able to contribute to the good of the entire community. That applies to other organizations as well. Who should bear the responsibility of making decisions for the group? The person who can make the best decisions. The person who has the most leadership, we would now say, but it's the equivalent of political virtue, as Aristotle understands it, for that particular group. Who should make the final decision with respect to the family? about whether we move, for example, or not. The person best able to make that decision. 
who should make the decision within the company about whether we open a new factory in Arizona? Answer is the person best able to make those kinds of decisions. And so we look to the relevant kind of merit, not only to determine rewards, but also to determine responsibilities. Who is best able to fulfill that responsibility? Who can do the best job? That's the person who should get the job. Who should best be able to fulfill that function? That's the person we should ask to take on that function. Which group is best going to be able to handle work on that project? Well, we should assign the project to that group. And so, in general, we look to, in this case, the people who can do the best job, the ones with the most relevant merit. As Aristotle thinks of it, those are the ones with the most relevant virtue, the ones who are best capable of fulfilling that task, of fulfilling that function, of bearing that burden, or taking on that responsibility successfully. And what defines that? It's a matter of the best outcome for the group. And so, I don't want to mislead you here. It's not as if Aristotle is what we'll later call a consequentialist, thinking we define this purely in terms of consequences. But consequences are an important part of this, because we want the leaders who can lead the best and do the best for the entire group. Now, Aristotle has an extremely broad notion of what that is. It's a matter of that group thriving, that group flourishing. But that's what we want. We want to give the responsibilities to those who will best enable the entire group to flourish. We want the leaders who will allow the company to flourish. We want the political leaders who will allow the entire country to flourish. And in general, that's our goal, to find people with the most relevant merit who can handle those responsibilities. They'll get rewards compensating for this, not only compensating, but they do get a reward attached to these positions, typically. But the important thing when we're thinking about responsibilities and burdens is who can best bear them? Who has the most relevant virtue? Which means who can best enable the group as a whole to flourish?